Our normal events, we do start off with trivia. Today we're going to do it a little bit different. Uh, we're going to mix it up a bit. Uh, we are not going to do trivia in the beginning. We're going to do it throughout. And by we, I mean our guest speaker, Amri, who is... Where do you go? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I guess we'll just, oh, there it is, okay. So Amrit will be doing the trivia throughout and be giving away really awesome prizes. Where are the prizes? This big box? It's a big mystery prize. No, wait, hang on. <laughs> yes, by all means, please. Can you hear me? Prize demo. Can you hear me? Hello, hello. Hello. How many of you use a wired headset? I don't know. You do? Cool. How often do you find your from your headset all tangled up? Okay, that's my headset. Take this little thing, flip it open. Like that. Put your headset in, close it up, and you're all set. Anybody who asks a good question or answers a good question gets one of these. For the first like 15 people. After that, you get out of luck. And for a couple more people, Amazon says they have gift cards. So that might work too. I think we just had an audience question how much. 25 to 500. Wow. Oh. <laughs> I have no idea about this. <laughs> You're not allowed to answer a question. How much are 25. Minimum. Minimum. 25. 25 to 500. 25. Okay, well, it's a gamble. You might get more. Um, okay, so tonight uh, we have two excellent speakers. Our first speaker uh, of the evening will be Amrit. I'm going to come back to him in a second. Uh, we also have Damien Hanka, who is a CTO, who is the CTO of Majestic Inc., which uh, is... How do you describe what Majestic Caps does? Uh, we are a mobile development company, predominantly, um, and we're kind of a technology strategy. This microphone! Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, it just got to go higher up. No, no, no he has to turn it on. Well, that works. Yeah, yeah. Technology? Uh, <laughs> it's hard work. Is that better? No. Um, 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 I, I run a uh, mobile development company. We build uh, mobile apps, we build websites, predominantly mobile apps though, and we help companies uh, scale their systems. And previously he was founder of Ink Labs, uh, which he founded with Lorenzo Fiomi, which for anyone who didn't recognize that name, that is indeed the inventor of Bing. So, Ooh. very impressive uh, startup there. Uh, he was also honored as a Smith Smithsonian laureate and as CTO of a virtual operating room, which was a pioneer of robotic medicine and virtual operating room, uh, operating rooms. Virtual, as in like doctor on one side of the world, you're being cut up in on the other side. Pretty cool stuff. <laughs> uh, so Damien will uh, speak shortly. Um, for now, we are going to start off with Amrit Kumar, who is the founder and CTO of Tesora. He holds four patents and has 20 plus years in enterprise storage and massive new parallel database. That's old. old. That's old. How many more? Five more. Five more. Twenty-five no, years. No, five more. Well, five more patents. Not twenty-five more years. Age break. So lots of patents, lots of years of experience, and, and uh, please welcome Amrit Kumar. Thank you. Everybody able to hear me? This is my fourth now. Okay, cool. Uh, so thanks a lot, Eric, for doing this. This is uh, the second time we're doing this event, and I think Database Month is a wonderful idea, so I love everything that uh, Eric's uh, doing in this area. Um, he also said that Damien is going to be presenting to you. Uh, quick note, I met Damien, I think, uh, or Damien heard about us at the last MySQL meetup, so um, always love to come to this event. So, uh, um, <coughs> Just a couple more beers if anybody wants to go grab them quick. Um, so what are we going to be talking about today? Um, we're basically going to be talking, I'm going to be doing effectively a presentation in two parts. Um, 
somewhere in the middle when you get bored of me and you start throwing stuff at me, we're going to get Damien up here. Uh, and he's going to be talking to you about a practical example of actually using the software we built. So basically, what do we do? Um, I work for a company called Tesora. Uh, Ken here and I started the company a couple of years ago. Um, and we basically build software to enable database as a service. And we'll talk a lot about database as a service and all of those fun things. Uh, we work a lot with OpenStack. I know a couple of people here have met already from other OpenStack meetups. So if you're interested in databases, relational or non-relational, no SQL, that's fine. Uh, if you're interested in cloud, OpenStack, um, lots of interesting stuff. If you are tweeting, interesting, Instagramming, and all that, there's a bunch of names you could stick. I guess this doesn't work on a TV, so we'll throw it away. Um, there's a couple of names there. There's mine and Damien's, so feel free to tweet pictures and all that stuff. Um, let's try and make this interactive. If you do have questions, shoot them up. Uh, we'll also have question answers at the end. All right? OK. So we get started. Um, what are some of the common problems you have faced with relational databases? If, if you're not using relational databases, you're not interested in the cloud, you're not interested in OpenStack, I think the fun part of the meetup is over. <laughs> uh, so, what are some interesting problems you have faced with relational databases? Anyone? Speed. Speed, okay. Scalability. Scalability, okay. Anyone else? Available. Availability, okay. Provisioning, anybody? How long does it take you to get a database in your company? <coughs> okay, what do you measure it in? Hours, weeks, months? Months. Months, okay, good. We should talk. Um, <laughs> you're a sales guy. Uh, I'm not the sales guy, so I won't be doing the sales pitch, but cool. So those are all common problems with relational databases. Scalability, availability, time to provision a database. They're all big nuisances. We'll talk about some of those things. Um, just so I understand, what environment do most of you use databases in? No, in what environment? Private cloud, public cloud, dedicated hardware, dedicated hardware. Virtualized, bare metal. Bare metal, okay. Anyone else? Cloud? Cloud. Cloud? Which cloud? Okay. Rackspace. Rackspace? Since we're in Lulu's facility, somebody please say Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, um, I've used it, it's good. Um, so, before going too much further, I do want to bring up a little bit of. Okay. Um, two important terms which we're going to be talking a lot about. Um, how many of you are familiar with database as a service in general? Anybody want to tell me what database as a service is? So what about people? Okay. So what about people who want to use a database in their private cloud? Uh, is database a service work there? Yes. It does. Okay. Um, cool. So since you got the first one right, what's the best platform? That's not the problem. Okay. So we'll talk about that. So a database as a service gives you, as he said, what's your name? Carlos. Carlos. Like Carlos said, database as a service. Hey, we're going to delegate this to you. Uh, a database as a service gives you the ability to provide provision an instance or multiple instances of databases. Um, Amazon RDS, anybody? OK. Provision an RDS instance. Um, it operates in some cloud. Private, public, whatever. Um, and you can provision it, and it provides you with some management capabilities as well. You can take a backup, you can take a snapshot, you can resize it, things like that. A database as a service platform, on the other hand, is something which allows you to operate a database as a service. Okay. You're running a you're an IT organization. How many here, how many people here? are part of an IT organization. Okay. Um, do people in your organization ask you for a database as a service? 
somebody please lift your hand. Okay, cool. And um, how would you do that? How would you provision and how would you operate a database to service in your in your own data center? <coughs> Um, 
And David was going to be talking about this some, but I figured I'd ask up front. If you have a database which doesn't scale, what are some of the things you do to try and make it better? Okay. Scale out, scale out. He said shard. He's going to chuck something at you. Okay. Caching layer. A caching layer is not really going to scale your database. It actually takes, makes, takes the load off the database. But yes, people find the database doesn't scale, and that's something which they do. Uh, gentlemen with the bar harbor. Oh, there you go. Okay. He's going. He distributed wanna, databases. Hey, cluster. Distributed databases. Distributed databases. Keep talking. Maybe uh, if your one instance isn't able to handle it, spread it across multiple servers. Okay, we're going to be talking about that. So, there you go. Creating partitions and uh, use number of indexes and things like that. There you go. Absolutely. You can do that. So, um, the basic idea of a database is service. These are, by the way, the answers to the question. I have no idea why the hell these slides are animating this way. So, if somebody has a way to turn out animation, that would be wonderful. Really? <laughs> okay. Right, another example of animation. Um, the basic idea of a database and service is make it easy for you to use a database. At the end of the day, and this is one of the reasons why we started this company, um, two and a half years ago, three years ago, whenever I spoke to people, everybody was of the opinion that I want to use compute. Amazon's wonderful. They got compute on demand. Can I have databases on demand? And by databases on demand, it's basically a question which says, I don't want to ask, I don't want to be asked a question, how big would you like your database to be? Since we're in a Google facility, let me ask you this. How many of you have a Gmail account? Huh. Pretty good. Okay. When you sign up for your Gmail account, did they ask you a question, how much email do you think you're gonna get? <laughs> when you ask for a database in the cloud, when people ask you, how big of a database do you want? That's not really on demand. So how do you make a database truly an on-demand resource? That's basically what we set out to do. We want it to be easy for you to get that. It takes you 30 seconds to get a Gmail account. Why can't you get a database in that much time? We want it to be scalable. You mentioned partitioning and horizontal scalability. You mentioned sharding. Sharding comes with its own complications, but yes, it's a solution. Um, and you want a lot of this administrative nightmares to be taken care of for you. You want backup and restore taken care of for you. You want to hit a button and say, there's a backup, we're all done. You want to be able to recover from that backup and not need to have a lot of, you know, your involvement in that. You, as an end user of the database, want to focus on the stuff in the application, not the stuff in the database. That's basically the way you want a database to serve. And why do we want a database to serve as platform? Because your IT organization needs to offer you a database as a service. They're going to use the platform. Okay, so let's get through this animation stuff again. Okay. Um, and this database as a service platform that you get should give you the ability to offer a complete database as a service to your customer. Internal, external. How do you get around the normalization process? So you've got, you've got data, you, you're using a front end, you're, you're not, first of all, it's not break it down. Mm -hmm. How does the database and service do that? It doesn't solve that problem. Database and service, or database and service platform by extension, does not solve the problem of database design. You still need to have people who can do a good design of the database, who can normalize tables, who can figure out how to join them, where to put indexes to join them, sort of procedures, views, all of that stuff, that's not a problem solved by database as a service. That is a problem which is solved by data as a service. We'll talk peripherally about that uh, and how people who are trying to build data as a service benefit from database as a service, but that problem is not solved by database as a service. Okay. So, the company I work for, Tesora, what do we do? Okay, uh, we make a database as a service platform, and we make primarily two kinds of software. Um, relational databases don't scale. They have their own intrinsic problems with scalability. You need to horizontally scale them. We build software which makes that possible. No SQL databases, they have, they have that thing taken care of. They horizontally scale, all of that nice stuff. 
We also, somebody doesn't agree with me, but that works for so one problem, the non-SQL, they don't do relational, absolutely. It depends on the problem. Correct. Absolutely. So you can you can hear a bunch of people who will give you the religious argument, which says no, 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 it has to be a relational database. I'm not one of those people. Um, depending on the problem you want to solve, you may want to use a relational database, or you want to use a non-relational database. You want to use a NoSQL database. You want to use a document store? That's the right thing for your application. Knock your stuff up. The database is a service platform which we're delivering will allow you to do that. We'll talk more about which ones and all that. That's a, that's a question later, so I'll hold that for later. Uh, but absolutely, if you want to use MySQL, perfect. If you want to use MongoDB, also good. Okay. Um, so we offer the platform, so if you're an IT organization and you're running OpenStack and you want to offer internally a database as a service to people, we got software for you. And we offer support services and all that stuff. So we're done with the sales pitch. Let's talk about OK, so we offer the first of our two products, uh, database virtualization engine. I'm going to talk a little bit about it, and then I'm going to hand it over to Damien, and he can tell you a little bit more about this. Um, this software basically allows you to horizontally scale MySQL databases. Okay? Um, a single server is not performant enough for you. Maybe you need to have several. Um, somebody up there said cluster. OK. Um, clustering is, in one specific case, similar to horizontal scalability, where all the copies in the cluster have the same data. That gives you the ability of replicating reads, but a write-heavy application may have trouble. The approach we're taking is to horizontally partition the data. So each instance in the uh, system has a fraction of the data. We'll, we'll talk some more about that. Uh, works for MySQL, works for Gona, MariaDB, and so on. Um, it's platform agnostic. It's currently in production in, in Amazon. It's in production in Joint. We've tested it in HP's cloud. We've tested it in Google's cloud. Um, and it has also been used in people's private data centers. So works anywhere you want. Um, you require zero application chain. Zero, by the way, is footnoted very clearly as a marketing term, so don't hold me to that. <laughs> in some cases, you may have to change your application. There's stuff which is not amenable to horizontal scale. If you have something like that, I'll be the first to tell you, you got to make some changes to your app. If your application is fundamentally one which is built for a large monolithic system, scale up may not be transparently possible. Okay. Um, we also deliver superscalar scalability. Anybody familiar with superscalar? Do you want me to talk about what it is? Yes, no? Yes. Yes. Yes, what? Say something, <laughs> Say something about it. Uh, so, I don't know about the educational system in the US, but I grew up in India, and by the way, I just happened to meet today somebody who I haven't met since 1988 when we were both in uh, undergrad school together. So we studied this stuff all the time. Um, a can do a piece of work in three days. A and B can do a piece of work in, if they work equally fast, how long can they do the work in? One and a half. One and a half, perfect. Um, a, B, and C all working as hard, how long will it take them? One day. One day. That's linear scalability. Okay. A can do a piece of work in three days. A and B working exactly as hard can do the work in one day. That's super scale. Meaning it's better than linear scale. Uh, there's specific reasons why we can do that. I have a graph and we'll talk more about it. But basically the idea is this. We partition your data into pieces. So let's assume you have a hunk of data, and it's uh, 50 gigabytes of data. And I divide it into five machines with 10 gig each. Five machines, we can go more than five times as fast. So we'll talk about why. Uh, somebody here mentioned high availability. There are no single points of failure. 
Here's a simplified architecture diagram. We'll just walk through this and we'll see why. Um, I can see this fine. Can you guys in the back see it? No. No? Yeah, so there's other monitors up there. So, Carlos, go ahead. Uh, right now, we work with 5.5 and with 5.6. We've tested with MariaDB. Uh, I think we we tested with 10, and we've announced 10 in a couple weeks. Yes. So, uh, and Dracona Server as well. So, so, on the very top of your picture here is your find your application, uh, and the box below it. That's our software. And these things at the bottom here are just standard MySQL instances. Okay? Uh, if you're running in Amazon, they may be RDS instances. They're fine. Okay? It's something which looks like MySQL. Um, your data is distributed on these ones here on the left, which are called persistent nodes, persistent sites. And there's a couple of different variations. Notice that there's two of them on a single machine. Here there's one on each machine. Each one is a logical database. Where it physically resides, I don't know, I don't care. Your data is partitioned four ways. Your application sends a query to our software. It never talks to each of the underlying databases. To your point about sharding, your application doesn't have to care whether the data is sharded by region or not. Just to you, the data is on that database, one database, asking a query. We'll make these databases dance. If they needed to generate intermediate tables, temp tables, they can put them on these sites called dynamic sites, which are just MySQL servers with no persistent data on them. Um, in some cases, we'll schlep the data over the network. But basically, from your application's perspective, no change. Marketing terms, no change. Um, if you're doing something which is entirely not horizontally scalable, you can rewrite a little part of your application and you'll get significant benefits. Um, this is a more practical situation. No single points of failure. You can have as many copies of our software as you want. Amazon Elastic Beanstalk, anybody? That's your Beanstalk image. This is a bunch of RDS servers. You've got your data horizontally scaled on a collection of RDS servers. As your application load varies, Spin up more of those things, you're done. That's Beanstalk going to take care of that piece. Go ahead. So basically, Zora is uh, holding all of the indexes and in, uh, you know, cluster pointers for, for servers, or how it works? No, so we, we have absolutely none of your data. We have, all we do is we, we see the query which your application sends us, and we figure out how to get a collection of servers to work together to give you the right answer. So, effectively, we're a SQL to SQL translator. We receive from your application, this instance receives a query. Okay. We make these servers, which is where your data is stored, do something, and whatever results they produce, we send that right back to you. If your data is stored on MySQL, your queries are processed by MySQL. We're just a middleware there. All right. All right. Couple of questions here. You first, you next. Does any of your system software reside on distributed servers? You can. It's RDS. You have absolutely no ability to put software out there. That's the reason I picked RDS in this slide. These are specifically Amazon RDS instances which you can't put software on there. So all we're doing is we're in a layer above it, above the RDS instances, below your own. So if, you're, if you have an image for some database, that image is untouched. Give me one second, you sir. In uh, on this slide and the previous one, who actually puts the who spreads the data the database across we, all the servers? We, so you do that as we well. We take care of that. Got it. From your application's perspective, when you're loading your data, when you're inserting new data, you got a new customer, you got a new order. Insert into table values block. We figure out where to put it. You can distribute tables based on a variety of different rules. You can make sure that they're distributed along with other tables. You can make sure that joins are fast, aggregations are fast. We can go into a lot of detail, but maybe we'll do that after the talk and uh, rather than in the talk itself. So I'll be here. Uh, lots of hands here. There's a hand. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Never mind. 
Yeah. Um, so basically, what you're saying is that uh, Tesora is an abstraction layer from the, from the databases. So it's it's only uh, a SQL uh, database as a service. Can I get the power of NoSQL here introduced somewhere to work along with Tesora? Or we'll it? talk about that in a couple of seconds. So Sorry. This the reason why we built this is because NoSQL already got this stuff. Relational databases did. So now effectively, when we offer a platform, this makes both NoSQL and SQL databases for us. That's basically the objective. So it's like a, a layer that connects to hybrid databases. Can I say that? Right now, not the hybrid database. Right now, it has to be homogenous. All of them have to be similar. Uh, all of them have to be SQL. Yes, we've tested it. No, we're not shipping that. Okay. So are you essentially like a, a master MySQL database, but it's not in the database layer, there, it's on the application layer, and those are slaves? We appear like a MySQL database. We speak the MySQL wire protocol. Your application thinks it's talking to a MySQL database. But are those configured as like slaves, and then? No, no. We, we're, not a, we're not a master, and they're not slaves. Remember, these are the only databases with your data. There's no data in this layer. Okay. Does this work as a drop-in addition to an existing database, or do we need to provision the database to your system? Um, if we already have an existing database. If you have an existing database, there's a migration strategy. Yeah, we can act like a replication slave. We can sit right next to You provision a bunch of MySQL servers, and install our software on one server, and then you can create as a replication slave, and everything just happens. One sec. Go ahead. Yeah, The whole idea of why we set why we built the software is because you can provision this dynamically on on the platform. Absolutely, and you can provision that on the fly as well. So basically, what we did was we took this monolithic database. I don't know, for some reason, every time we draw a database, it looks like a bear can. So we took this one database and chopped it in half. And there's a part which is query processing, which is scalable. There's another part which is close to data. The close of the data part is now independently scalable from the query process. So basically, okay. Sorry, go ahead. If I were to offer this in the private cloud, uh, I can't do it. If, if, I were, if I were to offer this in the private cloud, how do we, uh, are there any tools or ways to guarantee SMAs for throughput um, uh, and for performance? How do you, what so, do you what private cloud are you working in? Um, it doesn't matter. It's okay, uh, well, the, the only private clouds I can say for sure right now are either OpenStack or if you happen to be on Amazon, it's not private clouds, but those are the only two I can say anything specific about. Uh, you can monitor system responsiveness. If you're running in Beanstalk, for example, scaling this player is taken care of for you by Beanstalk. You can make Beanstalk scale this part of it on-demand scaling up temp space. Scaling this is based on how much data you have, and that's more like a manual administrative option. That's not something I would typically expect people to automate. Um, if you have a use case which happens to be different from that, I'm happy to chat with you. But in Amazon's case, and in OpenStack through the way in which you're providing stuff in OpenStack, you can automate a large part of this responsiveness. Other clouds, I'm not so sure. It, it, how much more um, overhead is your layer for? I, I have a slide about that, so please hold that question, and we'll we'll talk down to milliseconds and stuff like that. Since it's database as a service, can I assume if you expand uh, vertically, I get charged as a customer? Vertically, uh, horizontally. Which one? Vert, vert. Horizontally. 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 Other <laughs> horizontally. Other <laughs> horizontally. Other <laughs> um, if you spin off ten databases, how do I know I needed all those ten databases? How, how do I know you're not overcharging? Um, so, first of all, we're not operating the service, okay? Uh, so you're not paying us, we're not overcharging you. These are instances you're going to provision based on your need. <coughs> you provision as many as you need till you find that your system is responsive. Or going the opposite direction, you stop shrinking your system and you find it's not responsive. Basically, that's, that's the easiest way to do it. Uh, I've tried a couple of times. Honestly, this is something we've failed at. If somebody has an idea for how to do this, I'd love to hear it. 
I've tried to come up with a automatic system resizer. Every time I do it, I blow my feet off. You cannot really predict what happens in real life. You can try and predict it, but if you try to get smarter, you usually end up with a system which is either not as responsive or is you know, on a wire trigger and will do crazy things. So at the end of the day, a little bit of humor and, and, and human intervention is probably a good idea. Somebody around here have their hand up. Nope, okay. Um, all right, so quick, how does it work? Data is distributed across a bunch of persistent sites. Um, somebody here asked, how do you decide, you asked, I think, sir, how do you decide where to put the data? One time, DDL time, tell me where, how you want your data distributed. After that, totally transparent. Hey, this animation stuff actually is pretty useful. Um, we intercept the queries, we rewrite them, we send them for execution to the underlying dynamic and persistent sites, and we return the results. We do not do any query execution. We rewrite C. Why do you rewrite it? Oh, why do we rewrite it? Okay. So you got, you really want to hit him with something. Okay. Uh, why do you rewrite it? He was in the, uh, he was in the Red Sox. So you guys have a baseball team around here. What's the talk about? The Mets, okay. The Mets, okay. Uh, Don't get the one at 127 World Championship. <laughs> so when you distribute uh, data in your database, it would be nice if all schemas were simple star schemas, where you could say the fact table is distributed on the primary key and the dimension tables are all broadcast. Wonderful. More complicated schemas in, on occasion look at. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we can skip over all of that stuff. What if you were to have a row of data which is on this MySQL server and a row of data on this MySQL server and your goddamn query wants to join the two? Neither of those MySQL servers is going to be able to answer the query. We've got to intercept it and say, aha, there may be data which is not co-located. Get it over someplace where you can join it. That's why we have to rewrite it. Oh, uh, and I still didn't tell anybody what a broadcast table is. We'll get to that. So this is the point, by the way, where you guys are supposed to say that. Damien, you're up. <laughs> This works. Hi, I'm Damien Halka. I'm CTO. Um, just like I'm microphone's got to come up. It's. Uh, once you have the button, sure. If you want to. Tell me if you have to move it up for you. That's all. Oh, you can use that one. Um, oh, yeah. uh, so I'm Damien Honka from Majestic Apps. I am CTO and partner there. Um, I, my team and I build predominantly mobile apps. We also do websites and we counsel companies on massively scale on their systems. Um, I encountered Tesora when I uh, was at the, I wasn't, actually was not at the last event, but I saw it over stream, uh, web stream. Um, and I thought that Tesora represented a very elegant solution to the problem that we have with one of our apps. We tend to build a minimally viable, um, is this uh, we tend to build a minimally viable product uh, for clients, and we tend to also take an equity stake. Thanks. Okay, that's better. Um, so we tend to take an equity stake in the products that we build for clients. Um, and we build uh, a system that isn't necessarily scalable, scalable at the outset. So one of these products was um, called Buzzer. Well, let me back up. Um, so we have a very uh, storied history. Um, a lot of exits to large companies, Microsoft, Oracle, uh, Salesforce, and so on. Um, we provide client services, and as I mentioned earlier, we take an equity stake in a lot of the products that we build. Um, the MVP approach is not really amenable to a, a truly scalable product. 
So we're trying to build something to demonstrate or identify whether or not we can get traction with a concept that a client or we bring to the table. One of these took off. Uh, it's an app called Buzzer. It's targeted to um, mid-high school teenagers, and it allows them to upload photos, um, share those in their social network, rate them with emojis rather than uh, simply a, a like button. Um, and this became wildly popular for kids. Um, we had 40,000 users in the first week sign up, and this product is the MVP product uh, to uh, Screechy Cult. So right at that time, I saw uh, Amrith present to Sora. And when I saw this, I thought we have two options. We can rebuild the product, um, invest a great deal of time and resources in restructuring not just the application, but also the database. We could implement sharding in the database. Uh, sharding sucks. Um, it comes with its own, and it's a company with its own set of, of problems, and we, we really weren't sure which way to go. When I saw Tesora, uh, I, I thought it was extremely elegant. We suddenly had an option that we could implement in between our application and the database, and touch nothing in the code, and not even bother to change the schema. So it represented really a plug-and-play solution to a problem that we needed a, uh, to solve rapidly. Um, this, this group of, of kids uploaded more, well, well over a million photos. It's a highly active social network. Um, so we tried Tesora. Um, Tesora increased our, our uh, throughput 80-fold. Um, the app was wildly fast. It became instant. Went from sluggish to instant. Um, it cut expenses. Uh, interestingly, we we increased the number of RDS instances we had from one to five, but ultimately the cost for operating the system dropped dramatically, and the cost for um, Tesora for licensing Tor Tesora were covered in, I, I believe, three months. Um, <coughs> We're also uh, moving forward with the IBM Watson Group. Uh, we were recently selected as one of 25 uh, out of more than 3,000 companies that proposed products built on uh, IBM Watson. Is everyone familiar with what Watson is? Uh, so IBM's cognitive computer, uh, they were looking for mobile app developers to uh, make Watson relevant. And uh, we we proposed, they asked us, what would we do with IBM Watson if we had access to it? And um, I, we said that we surely would not do more financial modeling, uh, no weather predictions, um, no more customer service assistance, because these things are already being done on top of Watson. Um, and they're kind of, they're just not interesting to us. We thought, uh, why don't we put this inside of a toy and give it to kids and hold an educational conversation with them. And pair it with a mobile app, a tablet, implementation of a website that allow parents to monitor the progress of their child. So if a child, the, the, the toy begins with asking kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, if they say they want to be an engineer, then we know they need a proficiency in mathematics. So it allows a teacher and a parent to monitor over time where the student is or the child is predisposed for great success. We're going to use the Sora uh, without exception because we envision that this will, uh, will, will gain great traction. We have massive scalability in production, uh, manufacturing, and our partners, Toys R Us, Bale Schwartz, and Target uh, provide an excellent distribution channel. Um, so we see uh, the metrics that are, that are collected over the lifespan and interaction of this childhood companion, um, all of that data that's collected, we need that to be um, highly scalable, immediately available. Um, so we envision using Tesora uh, in the same way that we did with Buzzer. Any questions? So 
So the, the, uh, the app is going to be, the device, uh, the initial prototype will just be um, an iPhone. We have a system that, trans that converts text, uh, voice to text, uploads it to Watson over the API, receives an answer uh, or a question um, through the, its engagement advisor system, and then um, engages uh, with the child. The app that you pair with the device would run on Android or Apple tablets. Ultimately, it's probably going to be an Arduino type device inside the toy, and eventually like a wearable uh, uh, wristband and so on. So you mentioned how you came to use Pesora to solve your performance problems. And you mentioned also that you were using RDS, but RDS itself comes comes with some tools to uh, to you know multi-zone your database and all that. So why did you choose? Why did you decide to go this way versus that? We literally decided. Um, it, it's true, RDS does come with uh, some tools for improving performance and monitoring and assessing where the pain points were. There's no question that our database uh, schema was not ready for the scalability. But we're, we, because we take an equity stake in the things that we build, this drives down the amount of profit that we net upfront on building a product. So we're, we, we had the, the option to invest time. Uh, we thought, why not prove it's no? You know, this seemed like, if we can literally drop this in between our application and our database and change neither, um, I have to try that. Is that it? Yeah. I'm just searching for the little switch here. Okay. Actually, I have a question. Yes. yes. So, what is, can you just elaborate what is friendly anthropomorphic network genome? Uh, well, it's, it's actually the truth is we have another product. Um, <laughs> We have another product in uh, uh, Toys R Us, FAO Schwartz, and some other retailers that's uh, like a plush toy and it has a QR code um, stitched to its belly. And the idea is you buy this, this uh, toy and you scan it into an application um, on a tablet and it unlocks an educational game experience. So the, the first one, there are like 12 or 18 varieties of panda bear, a pig, and so on. Uh, one of them is a bear and it has a single fang. So initially that's why we codenamed it fang. It won't be called that um, on the market. Um, and then uh, a friend, Ross Clefani, coined uh, the friendly anthropomorphic network genome, which actually makes sense. So be smart. It goes out again just from like a Ridley Scott movie. <laughs> yes? Uh, so I have a question, like suppose I have one million row in my table. So does your software divide it into four different partitions at different different tables? That's for you. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I asking about this app. Uh, okay, so yeah. Our microphones are fighting here. Okay. Um if you have a table with Depending on what you're going to do with more there, because it seems to come every time I come here. Um, depending on what you're going to do with that table, we could either one partition it across multiple zones, or we could specify that that table is a broadcast dimension table, where we will maintain a transactionally consistent copy on each node, a joint lookup table. Sure. So, so suppose if one node goes down, and I just get like half of the data, that, will it do an error no, 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 you won't ever get half of the data. Let me, let me tell you why. Oh, the animation is so wonderful. Each of these, by the way, is logically one MySQL server. It would be a much more complicated picture. Each of these could be a master with multiple slaves. Standard MySQL replication is semi-synchronous, Galera, whatever you want to do. Just tell us where's the master and what are all the slaves you got. 
tell us, we'll try and always talk to the master. If the master is not reachable for this slice, then we'll go to a secondary, and we'll still give you the correct answer. No single point of failure, if you configure your system as such. This picture says RDS. It's a collection of RDSs. Multi-AZ, somebody mentioned that. Multi-AZ here. Okay. <coughs> yes, sir. So basically, uh, how the Tesoro is improving the response of uh, the queries, it's making redundant data. Is it so? Uh, not redundant data, no. But it's horizontally scaled. So you're familiar with Hadoop? Yes. OK. Hadoop basically gets its power by having multiple machines working together. But you've got to write a Hadoop job in Java and all this funny stuff. What if you could do that all in SQL? Massively parallel, standard SQL. That's what we're doing. How do you handle caching? Caching data? Above us. So as far as we're concerned, caching is above us. And also below us, MySQL has embedded caching. Right. We do some caching of our own. We cache query plans. We do not cache query results at this point. Um, we cache the rewrites of queries. If a person gives us this query, here's how we would execute it. We also say, this person gave us this query, and we chose to execute it this way, and it really sucked. So the next time the person asks us the same query, try and find a better way. So that's how you handle the latency? We handle some learning. So we'll talk about that in a second. Anyway, so I talked about performance. You asked about performance. So, great. Right. Um, standard benchmark, this was in this particular case, I think the picture shows Sysbench, um, other benchmarks as well. A single MySQL server can do, I don't know, oh, animation, 17 and a half TPS. Okay. You put three servers together, we get 60 TPS. Okay. Uh, Matt was in the room, 17 and a half times 3. Hmm. Okay, so not 60.4. Okay, okay, you get five of them together, we get 130. Did I mention super scalar? Okay. This is the straight line. It's not 45 degrees because this is 135, it's not linear axis, all this kind of stuff. That's linear scale. We do better than linear scale, and the question is, how the hell can you manage to do better than linear scale? There's a couple of reasons. Um, if you have a table with an index, and your table is smaller, the number of levels in the index is maybe less. Index access is faster. If your queries include joins, by the way, these particular queries don't include joins. Suspense has aggregations for no joins. Uh, if your queries happen to include joins, we get similar performance benefits. If you have a join between two very large tables, and the partition product is increasing in size, as the size of that table increases, responsiveness exponentially degrades. When you have smaller tables which you're joining, the size of the partition product exponentially reduces, therefore you get two OK. So five nodes better than five tenths of performance. Um, this is a effectively a single system is a single table benchmark. Um, Damien mentioned Damien, Damien, Damien mentioned an 80 times performance improvement. He did not have 80 RDS service. Um, he has a handful of RDS servers. I can count the number of RDS servers on the fingers of one hand. The performance of the application improved by ADS, measurably. Okay. Um, so, anybody else, if somebody had questions about performance. Any other questions about performance at this point? Yes, overhead. Overhead, overhead. yeah, I'll, I'll come to overhead in a second, yes. Did not forget that. And how is handling like right and right the issues, for Jeez, example? You're, you should really give him a second. So, <laughs> for example, if I do have uh, a number of transactions at the same time and someone is trying to query something. By the way, these are all standard database transactions. Each transaction, including multiple queries, oh boy, <laughs> some of the cards are coming loose. Make sure there's a card in that, not just the. Yeah, but it's here. Right. <laughs> if, you had a bad question, if you ask a bad question, I'll ask for the card back. If you <laughs> uh, so, each of these transactions is 14 queries. Uh, 10 of them are selects, I just remember this. 10 of them are selects, 3 of them are, 2 of them are deletes, 1 of them is an insert, 1 of them is an update. The entire thing has to be transactionally consistent. Okay? Now, we partition the data across multiple nodes. The selects are getting data from multiple places. The selects include joins. 
uh, so this, the select include aggregation of a single table. The insert inserts multiple rows. The delete, the delete, the delete, the different set of rows. So you might delete some rows here, insert rows here. So it's a two-phase commit transaction, all transparent. So we deal with that. But this is primarily a, so there's 14 queries, 10 of them are reads, a couple of them are writes. OK. We had a, we had a sorry, Carlos, go ahead. So whatever the database under the covers happens to do, we'll do. In this case, it's MySQL. MySQL doesn't have UCC. Well, I it's an open architecture. Right now, we're shipping MySQL. Soon, we're going to be shipping other databases as well. Um, so I have tested with Oracle Postgres SQL Server, MySQL. Somebody asked about heterogeneous <coughs> databases. I tested where one of the instances was my Gmail mailbox, and I just put a little stuff which would do a select. I have select. You can do a joint against the mailbox. So, Inodb support MVCC. Inodb supports MVCC if you specify your serialization level, if you set your isolation level to be serialized. Yes. And then we will support. So we'll pass it through directly. Uh, not everybody runs it that way. The default with MySQL is repeatable read for good reason. Uh, okay, so reading data is lots of fun, but we got approached by a, uh, a telco who said they were getting CDRs. Every time you make a cell phone call, there's a call data record which is written into a database somewhere. And uh, ingesting data was a big problem. So we demonstrated to them that we can with 15 MySQL servers, and this was all done in Amazon RDS. Um, Damien did mention briefly that with horizontal scale, you can get a lower cost. The reason is because a larger server is exponentially more expensive. So we have 15 and one extra large server. Uh, it's a whole lot cheaper than having a whole bunch of you know, M2 4XL or M3 4XL or whatever. A single MySQL server ingesting CDR records could do under 200,000 rows. With 15 of them, we were able to easily do a million rows a second. And we were pushing the network at this point. And Amazon doesn't give you the ability to push the network, so we didn't have much of a choice about this. But you can ingest a million rows of data a second. If you have a workload which needs more than that, spin up a couple more MySQL servers and you'll be good to go. So one server, under 200,000. Five servers, under 400,000. 15 servers, over a million. Uh, is it super scalar? No, it's not. That's because we don't control Amazon's um, Testing in other environments produced much better results, but I'm not able to show those. Things. So do you plateau at any time, or is it just an exponential increase? I mean, there must be. You plateau when you hit the network wall. Yes. Or you plateau when you hit the disk wall. One or the other. Basically, our overhead, and this is your question about overhead, this is the reason why we're not the bottom. Sorry. So, so to get an increase, you have to make the rate and scalability and plus uh, have 15 servers and things like that, but how about the hardware limitation that we can, you know, face with the, this uh, uh, hard drives and stuff like this? I mean, hardware is not running on SSD, it's still, you know. Spinning rust, exactly. Yeah. So those are Amazon RDS servers, which were larger, extra larger, which are not SSD. So whatever you get with that, that's what we're getting. We're, we're kind of a startup. We've not tested this with you know 15 dedicated high-end servers. I mean, because I I had a project with the um, process payment processing company with the core aviation <coughs> companies, mm -hmm. and I've been facing while well, migration data and at the same time for receiving uh, income data out of the financial processes, payments, and stuff like this, I faced lots of issues with, you know, uh, bottlenecks of read and write with the hard drive system. And I, I had no hands on it because it was on a cloud server. OK, so it's, we can definitely help you with that if you're willing to scale over time. Uh, 
How does uh, the SOAR um, compare to Clustrex, which is another scalable uh, MySQL database? So under the covers for standard MySQL, so Clustrex is not. <coughs> Clustrex gives you a MySQL veneer, but under the covers there are custom engine. Your queries at the end of the day, in our case, are on standard MySQL. Do you want to use a different storage engine? Sure. But what's exposed is uh, uh, MySQL. So Correct. what they have in the blind box, who cares? It's your blind box versus their blind box. No, who cares is actually really relevant because okay. your application in many cases says, if, if your application's two-minute installer says, install blah, 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 engine equals MWB. Engine equals some other engine. It's plus to deal with that. Does it support everything in MySQL? And I ask this question knowing fully well that there are things in MySQL which we don't support. But it's a different set of things they don't support. I can guarantee, actually I can guarantee absolutely that if you pick up most off-the-shelf CMSs which I've seen and try and drop them on Clustrix, they won't install. Are there so places that swear by it? I guess some absolutely. There's some there's some Absolutely. No, I'm not swearing at it. I'm just saying it's a different group. You ask what the differences are. I'm not saying they're bad. They're fine. They, they were agreeable with the whole set. Okay. Yes, sir. 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 So, okay, so we don't use, we don't, fractal trees are under the covers. If you want to use TokyoDB, knock yourself out. Um, Tim Callahan was actually walking back. He's taking the train back to Boston today. This song. Um, our CPU utilization, exactly, this is our CPU utilization. A single MySQL server, single MySQL server in a test line takes four milliseconds, 4.08. With us, it takes 4.71. Our overhead, Two thirds of a millisecond. Do you use the whole application? So you can take some amount of performance? We are efficient. We're getting more efficient. This particular slide is April 2014. The last time I did the presentation, which you were at, this number probably was 1.3 milliseconds. Um, so you probably remember that. This is one half of that. Uh, and at the end of the day, this entire time, is the time we're taking here largely CPU. We can know I.O. The only I.O. we do if we do network. The bottleneck is net is network, <coughs> but we're in your critical path. Absolutely we're part of the bottleneck. We're part of the overhead. Overhead bottleneck, you know, once you've missed the quick saying the other thing. We are in your data path. What is the meaning of this query? If you're doing high frequency trading, we're the wrong solution for you. Okay? Yes, sir. I wanted to see how you design your data. Do you have any PHP, MySQL admin kind of PHP, PHP, um, PHP my admin works. Um, I don't have any slides about it. Let's talk about it. Okay. okay. All right. So. So what are we talking about? Horizontal scale out of databases, deliver super scalar, all this fun stuff. Okay, very nice. Single point of failure. I am kind of about 15 minutes behind. Um, all right, let's talk about something different. How many people here are familiar with OpenStack? Okay. You don't know. You can't raise it. All right, so um, a wonderful tool which Google provides us is Google Trends. And if you just look at the number of people searching for things, it tells you about where it is in Mindshare. Um, okay, Amazon Cloud, Redline, everybody knows about that. Okay. Microsoft Azure is the yellow line. If you're not able to see the yellow line, it's the one which is almost flat. Um, OpenStack started about 2011. It's way surpassed, uh, surpassed Azure, and it's on the way to becoming as well known as Amazon RDS. Okay, so trivia questions. Any questions? <coughs> Open
Ubuntu staff release names? Anyone? Okay, Ubuntu release names, everybody knows what the heck these things are. Hey, no, no, no Googling, come on. <laughs> <laughs> We just right. get released like you No, no, not you. He's actually putting on his point. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody but you? <laughs> what are the release names? What are some upcoming and recent release names for OpenStack? Yes? I, the name that the city is. There was like Austin, Nice. There was. Yeah, of course. Oh, you know. Okay. Well, that's those the See, yeah, we're, in post, post, we're allowed to. Yeah. It's actually right. Our, our, our normal trivia, we say whoever wants to cheat can do it. Whoever's got the fastest service can do it. He's right. actually right. That's not the mention. Okay, that's the convention. Okay, so hit him hard if you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're, you are correct. Uh, uh, so OpenStack release names, Grizzly, Havana. So by the way, they're not city names necessarily. Okay. They're things related to the city. Um, and they're alphabetical. G, H, and I. Next one is J, which is Juno, um, coming out soon. Okay. EC2 is the Amazon project. What's the OpenStack project for compute? Anybody? People who attended the OpenStack meetup in Boston may not answer this question. Anybody? No? Open no, it's a <laughs> What are the projects for storage? Nobody should know about this. There's a company we just got a quarter a couple of days ago with the storage for OpenStack. Yes? No? Anybody? No. Okay, there's two projects. One is Block Storage, which is called Cinder, and one which is Object Store, which is called Swift. You'll see them in a picture in a couple of minutes. Exactly. 
Trove is not a relational database service. Trove supports. Right now it supports flavors of MySQL, Cassandra, Redis, and Mongo. So if you're using any of these, it supports all of them. OK. Um, what is OpenStack Trove? It's the OpenStack Database as a Service project. It makes it easier for you to use a database. Um, it is going to be coming out in the Icehouse release. Icehouse is the current release. Okay. Um, it deals with all of your administration and stuff, provisioning and stuff like that for any database. MySQL, Mongo, Cassandra, Redis, we're working on some others as well. It takes care of standard configurations, configurations which are known to work, um, a lot of standard administrative things, backup and restore, replication, snapshots, resizing an instance, make it small, make it big, all that stuff. It is truly a database as a service. And we'll talk about some examples of why this is the case. Um, just a quick block diagram. Um, this is a view of database as a service as a platform. At the lowest level, all the things which OpenStack gives you. One level up, sure, gives you a database as a service. But all these other things are plugins on top of a database as a service. You want to do some fancy replication? Sure. You can do that too. You want to do horizontal scale out or multi tenancy? We give you software for that. Color coding, by the way, that comes with the sort of DVD. These are other plugins which you can get for sure. Um, a very quick architecture kind of slide, not to talk about the architecture in detail, but to tell you something about what are the various parts. Trove as itself has a, has a notion of operating under the control of OpenStack. These are all of the various OpenStack services which are running on the right hand side of this picture. There's Nova, there's Swift, Neutron, Keystone is the identity service, Glance is the image service, Easy to Amazon users, the place where you put AM mice, that's the code in the class. When you spin up a Trove instance, which is the stuff with this dotted line here, all you get is a little thing called a guest agent. You um, sort had asked whether you put anything in RDS on the guest agent. In OpenStack, that's the thing you put on the guest, that's the guest agent. Other than that, it's the standard database and nothing more. Okay? You, pro you provision it, you make changes to it with a CLI, there's a web interface, uh, all of those things. More useful to look at it this way. <coughs> Everything which you want to do with OpenStack, there's a RESTful API. You want to program against it, knock yourself out. You want to provision an instance, resize an instance, you want to manage it, you want to take a snapshot, you want to take a backup, you want to provision a new one, all support it. The most important thing you get out of this is you can quickly and easily operate a database. Okay. Questions before I move on? How long does it take to implement another trove support for another database? Is it like a week or a month? It depends entirely. The question was how long does it take to implement support for another database? Um, the answer is it depends on how much support you want for that database. If you want to do bare bones support for the database, a couple of days, uh, you want to do a much more sophisticated thing, the database has all kinds of bells and whistles, it will take a little bit longer. But the basic thing for you to get a new guest agent configuration set up and going, a couple of days at least. And by the way, if you, the good thing about open source, you can see what all the other guest agents are doing. And there's a template for a guest agent which you can plagiarize happily from. Um, so the most important thing to remember is, like RDS is more than an EC2 instance, Trove is more than just a VM. It gives you a lot of capabilities which you won't have if you just spun up a Nova instance and you put your own stuff on it. If you spun up an EC2 instance and put MySQL on it, you don't get all the bells and whistles which RDS gives you exact same story. It's a secured instance. You have no SSH access to it. It supports things like resizing. It supports things like uh, replication. And it supports you know, the ability for you to treat it as a standard database for your application perspective. By the way, OpenStack doesn't come in the way of that. 
Whatever your application wants to do to the database, knock your stuff up. Okay? So the database as a service platform, which we built on top of it, is software and services around the troll. So pretty soon we're going to be talking about where you can get a copy of that. Um, it's compatible with Kavana, which, by the way, that's the list of the recent releases, Kavana, Grizzly, and Icehouse. Trove is being released with Juno. A lot of people are already using Kavana and Grizzly. What are you going to do if, let's say, Trove is going to be released with Juno? Trove is released with Icehouse, which is right now. What are you going to do if you're already using Kavana or Grizzly? Well, you can use our distribution. Um, so a quick use case here. Uh, we talked earlier about data as a service and somebody who's actually trying to use open stack control. This is a practical use case of a very big media company. They've got you know, metric shitloads of data. I think that's measured in you know, petabytes or exabytes or something fancy like that. They can't possibly keep all of it queryable at all times. So they have it on some secondary slow disks. Um, but they have analysts who periodically want to run some set of queries. And right now, talk about the painful part. It takes months for them to provision a database, get the data loaded, and then it takes a whole long time for them to actually load the data before they can get to the point where they can query it. It takes a long time. And this is a pain for them because First, they can't keep all the data online, but if you can't query your data, you might as well not have it. Okay. Um, in some cases, they've gone and loaded up a bunch of data onto a database, they waited three months and they find the database instance is not properly sized, they gotta start all over again. Okay, so, when we went and talked to them, here's what they wanted. Same picture as last time, just change the labels. I want self-provisioning of my database and I want to be able to quickly be able to query it. So, on a standard OpenStack uh, implementation, we built this reference architecture for them. Not maybe in the center of the picture, the heart of that architecture is the catalog which says, here's all the data sets I have. Here's all the information which I can get you. Here's the columns, here's the rows, here's the regions, here's the year ranges, everything which I want. And analysts can query that database. Oh. The data itself is stored inexpensively on Swift. When an analyst comes along and says, I want information for New York City and some other specific areas, and I've got a data set where these tables have got 74 attributes and I only want four, and I don't want all the data from 1987 to 2014, give me the last six months. They specify those criteria and get a button. When they do, we get just that data loaded in through us as fast as we can onto a collection of Trove servers, which are running for Kona in this particular case. And the data itself is going to be stored at that point in time on Cinder. We'll talk in a couple of minutes about the actual time it takes to do all of this. But basically the idea is, a large amount of data stored inexpensively. A user can search the catalog, simple web interface. On demand, they provision a horizontally scalable database, and they can run queries again. Okay? Any questions about what problem we're trying to solve while we're doing it in the web? In a federation system, or just on the data that you are allowed to have some company so, in this particular case, what they're doing is they're dealing with the visibility of data by making sure the catalog has the appropriate things in it that if you're only able to see a specific set of data sets, it'll only show you those. If that gentleman's allowed to see an entirely independent set, he'll only be able to see those. At the end of the day, if both of you make requests, your respective data might land up on the same servers. You might not know it. From your perspective, you ask for a database, you are given a connection endpoint, that's it. This is your application, that's his application. That's it. They're walking the planet. 
What is the target? Okay. So basically what we did was we took our existing horizontal scalability technology, we put it in place, we used Casora DBAS for this, and we gave them the ability of multi-tenancy. We're not going to go into a whole lot of detail, but that was the exact example of multi-tenancy. Both of you are asking for something very similar, and the schema happens to be very similar, but you have totally different data sets. We can help scale that. Okay, top real number. From the point in time where a person pressed a button saying, I want the database as a service, to the point where the thing is up and running, seven minutes. Load data, how much of our data you want to have, add some amount of time for that. Okay. The fundamental difference here is this. Um, and, okay, so let's talk about a couple of these things. It's our horizontal scale mechanism. You minimize your storage cost because most of the time you're storing stuff on some inexpensive long-term, you know, the equivalent of S3, swift storage. So the real value in this is a person can quickly get a database with data. That's something which is in value. Oh, you don't get that. Seven minutes to get a database used to be measured in one, one of them. The unintended consequence of this is if you have a database, where you have a system where somebody's going to take months to get a database, hours to load it, or days to load it, and hours to query it, you can change that. You fundamentally change the way in which the analyst thinks. I ran a query against some data set. I got an answer. Well, you know, that's not the answer I wanted, but it gave me another idea. Here's another question I want to ask. The whole iterative thought process thing in here. If it's going to take him another six months to get another database, screw it. He's going to take whatever answer he got and do it and be done with it. If you got an answer in a couple of minutes, ten minutes, half an hour, half a day, he'll ask a different question and another question. Now you really start to get the right thing. Quick question. Um, you, your seven minute uh, provisioning. How big was the data, data set? In this particular case, the data set, the, the provisioning here is to launch the database as a service. There is no data loaded at this point. Okay. In, this is basically the guy that hits the button, and he says, provision me a database. This is to address the first part of the picture where it takes months to get a database in the first place. In the case of this particular test, um, we did a test with, you know, something. Basically, an open source data. Um, the government distributes this data set called on-time arrival. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's basically every aircraft in the continental U.S. Um, since 1987 until today, and so on and so forth. We can load that entire data set of every flight in the continental U.S. since 1987 until today. Uh, and that's the entire data set which says, where did it take off from? Where is it going to? Um, what is the airline code? What is the aircraft? number, was it on time, was it late, how many minutes late, and it's a really white table. So you're, you're pulling it from an object store? We're pulling it from an object store, materializing it onto a block store, loading it from the block store into a database. And oh, by the way, the format of storage in the object store is Avro. If you're familiar, if, how many of you are familiar with Avro? Self-describing Apache format storage. So the schema is embedded in the NAND. So you can literally point it and say, I want to be one of that data file. It gives you the schema and loads it as well. Yes, ma'am. Does the seven minutes include identifying the partitions as well? Uh, yes, it does, because the person who is publishing the data to the catalog tells you how the data needs to be loaded if you want. It. So that has already been determined for you up front. But, but a human has to determine that or the, or the software. In this particular case, it was a test, it was a human who had determined it, it was me who had determined it, and I basically decided how I wanted to distribute the data. In practice, how you would want to do the partitioning, that's a good point. That is probably something which you add on at the end of this. Because realize here, the schema is not created. All you got is a bunch of database servers. If you want to put a schema on top of it, add a couple of minutes. Other questions? Um, so fundamentally, at this point in time, you're getting away from a process which takes many months to a process which takes many minutes, which is fundamentally going to change the way in which you do uh, business. 
So, if you don't have other questions, then we're going to move, move along. Yes? Um, what happens when you're joining tables to themselves? When you join tables to themselves, are you joining in a manner which is good? So, in some cases, you're joining along whatever your distribution mechanism is. That's wonderful. If you join against that, so you have you have two keys, you distribute on one key and you want to join against another key. At this point in time, our query rewriting is not as optimal as it should be. Um, very soon we're going to be coming up with something which will make it better. I have to tell you more about it. But at this point in time, if you are joining a table against itself and the table is really large, that's not a particularly happy use case for us. Um, Graph queries tend to do that. And addressing that, if yours is really a graph query where you want to join a table to itself multiple times, um, there are probably better ways of doing it. But if you're stuck with a horizontal scale relational database, we'll be able to do it better than the ones. Not very good way. Sorry, I'm not the sales guy. I can tell you it's wonderful, but you want to be sure. Um, so what's a database as a service platform? We talked about that. It's software which allows you to operate a database as a service. What is Tesora? It's the name on the t-shirt. It's also a company which makes this uh, product. We thought we heard from Damien. Thank you, Damien, by the way. I forgot to do that. Uh, about their, their use of Tesora in, uh, and by the way, they're in AWS and Amazon. Um, we talked about OpenStack and Show and we also talked a little bit about a database as a service platform in the OpenStack. Okay. I'll leave this slide up and ask if you guys have any other questions. Anybody going to Atlanta, by the way, next week? Anybody going to OpenStack Summit with that? Yes? No? No. Okay. Cool. If you change, if you change your mind, we'll get me there. Um, if you're interested in OpenStack, uh, you're not you're not coming? No, you're going to West. When it's next week. Oh. Possible. Possible? Okay. Um, if you are interested in OpenStack, if you think your company is going to be doing OpenStack and you want training in OpenStack, we offer training as well. If you are interested in OpenStack, um, you get a, an email every week, we call ShortStack, which gives you a list of interesting things about OpenStack. Go ahead and sign up. Um, you can also read our blog. And follow us on Twitter. Okay. Some of you wanted contact information, so here's contact information if you have an idea for a mobile app. Is the source going to be at the, the product or in the temperature or the export? I am not sure, but I'll check. If you have an idea for a mobile app, like I was saying, speak to uh, Damien and, and Majestic. If you have a database which needs help, Give us a call. Sorry, somebody had a question. Sorry, or maybe before we go on to Q and A, uh, just hang on one moment. I want to give a great big round of applause to uh, Amrit Kumar and the <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the DB is almost entirely Java. All of OpenStack is Python. Most of the stuff we're doing in OpenStack is in Python. There's no necessity, by the way, that everything in OpenStack is in Python. If, for example, in your own company you wanted to do OpenStack, you could implement a portion of it in any language you want. The beautiful thing about the fact that everything in OpenStack is RESTful, you use Erlang, okay? Knock yourself out. You can do that too. If you can do a RESTful API call in Erlang, you're good to go. So I hesitate to hang the hand. Yeah, so, so I have two questions. Is, is there a use case for Tesora in like a geographic kind of uh, redundancy? So we've, we've tried a couple of different things with geographic redundancy. I'll, I'll give you a couple of very high level descriptions of what they are. Um, link shorteners. Bigly as an example. A common use case is that you're going to submit a link and then you're going to share it via email, tweet, whatever. 
You happen to be in New York. I happen to be in Bitly, and I happen to have a server here. Uh, and the magic of DNS says that wherever you are in the world, your Bitly link refers to the server in geography. And in that geography, somebody's going to resolve your link for you. Okay. Between the time that you shorten your link and you post it, and the person on the other side of the world wants to look at it, there is potentially a value. So long as we're able to replicate the data over in that period of time, when the person in, I don't know, Russia looks at your link, he could have replicated it to that database. That particular use case is a very, very good use case for a horizontal scale data. If, on the other hand, you want synchronous white area replication, and you want to have a multi-master system. Uh, we're fundamentally not at this point trying to change the speed of light or anything profound like that. So those limitations are still perfect. So under those constraints, you can have a distributed, geographically distributed, multi-master horizontally scale database, uh, which works for a second. Semi-synchronous, and so long as if there is a conflict, you're willing to resolve it in the application. Again, we're not going to be able to deal. So the moment you say something is semi-synchronous, conflict resolution becomes required. And if you have conflict resolution, we're not going to get into the business of saying which one do we want to pick. No single database is take the pick. The option which says most recent wins. We're still leaning towards the relational database. So Conflict resolution is left to the application, so you don't have to resolve that. We have time for just a few more questions. What uh, it's intro middleware? Do you have any kind of thing? I do a straight screen or do you use something? We have we have a complete web UI, yes. So what does it look like? I don't have an internet connection handy. What does it look like? Um, do I have a screenshot handy? All right, while well, I'm looking for that, anybody else got a question? Yes. Uh, are there any concerns about the cost of balancing and hot nodes and the ability to read the slowest nodes to respond? How do you take balance both from the load and the size of the So the question was, from a cluster balancing perspective, how do you manage balancing across multiple nodes? Um, hold the thought. I don't have a picture of which I can actually give you. Uh, how do we manage? Cluster balancing across nodes. If you are building a horizontally, sorry, you asked the question. If you build, if you're building a horizontally scale database, you are at some point going to provide a response to your application in the same time as your slowest server. Okay. The things which we've been able to do to address that problem is scale your data horizontally. If you pick a reasonably non-lumpy distribution peak, all the nodes will get equal amounts of data, or approximately equal amounts of data. If you are not able to do that on the first try, we give you the ability to do some amount of rebalancing. So you can say you want to move a particular key to another location. We can definitely do that. But at this point, none of that is on There's no hash. Are they built in hashing? It is a bit about hashing. So one of the things I mentioned was the five nodes which we call your persistent node, which is where you distribute your data, you can add nodes on the fly. And we will automatically send new data to the new node, which is a little bit more than just standard hashing. So the standard hash, the moment you add two more nodes, you have to necessarily do a redistribution. We don't have that requirement. Using the same kind of mechanism, we give you ability to do some amount of rebalancing. But at this point, it is manual. Um, this is one of those things which uh, I, I used to work at a company called Visa before. Uh, um, we had a customer who, uh, our second customer was in the UK, large helper, foreign currency division. They bought a one node machine and they loved it. They said, We have another question, we want to buy two nodes, a two, two rack machine, a two Basically, 200 nodes. That thing was so good that within a couple of months they said, we now want to upgrade that to a four-node machine. And our answer was, 
Sure. We'll send you a four a four rack machine and a sales engineer to do the migration. Because there is no way to add the nodes to that machine. One of the things we can build is the ability for you to actually horizontally scale without doing that. We can use some of the same capabilities, but they are manual. We try to do it automatically. It's not easy. We don't have time for any more questions, but we do have about 60 seconds left. So just for one more prize, anyone want to guess what that is on the monitors? I can. I <laughs> <laughs> Boston. Oh, that's pretty close. That's nah, 40 miles west of Boston. Yeah. <laughs> e for effort. All right, have a look. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the view in my backyard. Oh, <laughs> okay. I want to give a great big thank you to our oh, good day here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.